and we are live, everyone. This is the Game Session Podcast. I'm your host, Jose slash Seth Rukage. Um, before we go ahead and start, just want to go ahead and tell everyone watching to like, comment, subscribe, and all the other related things on all the socials. That includes Twitter, Twitch, and YouTube. You can stay up to date with all of us the best on Twitter with all of our handles on screen right now. Uh, today, we are joined by Sarah, who, now that she's not on camera, uh, can audibly cue oh. herself. Hi, I've been playing a lot of Dragon Age. Oh God, please, please, please help me, please. <laughs> jo- for you. Joined no. by Mesa, the newly renewed camera, but not using. It's 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 a jungle in here. It's 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 a bit of a problem. I I, I have to I have to address it. <laughs> We're uh, joined again by, who is basically our fifth member at this point, Blaine. Hi. I, how many have you been on? Who the fuck knows? I mean, I could look it up. I just don't want to. But then I, but then me saying who the fuck knows would no longer be fun. That's yeah. true. I have to, I have to keep it going. That's true. And we're also joined by a very special guest. I think you have. We have been trying to get you on since episode two or three, and it's just been schedule conflicts on both ends. But we managed to get you ten episodes in. <laughs> Uh, we're joined by Matt, uh, also known as uh, Stormageddon or DJ Stormageddon. Hey, hey. I'm happy hey. to be here. Thank y'all for having me. Uh, yeah, I, I'm on the East Coast, and so when y'all record at like 9 o'clock your time, that's like midnight for me, and I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm an old man. That is just too <laughs> late for me. Um, but no, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I'm a fan of the show, and uh, I'm excited to be a part of it. Has anyone hey, ever told yeah. you that you sound a little bit like Dan Reichert? And no. that makes me incredibly happy. <laughs> no, that's a first, actually. <laughs> I've heard a lot of different things, but that's first. But I'll take it. Sure, why not? Has anyone ever asked you if you know that you're also named after a character from C-Lab 2021? So, no. It's funny. The origins, to just derail the whole podcast at the start, uh, the I origins know. of my DJ name, Stormageddon, is actually from Doctor Who. I knew There's... it. I knew it. I knew it. Uh... <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so... so um, I used to, before the apocalypse, DJ for burlesque shows in New York, and uh, I would just DJ under my actual name, which is Matt Storm, and a uh, performer named Nasty Canasta, who is one of my closest friends, uh, just decided one day after that Doctor Who episode aired that I was Stormageddon from then on. That was my name, and it stuck, and so, and then I actually started DJing professionally under it, and uh, and here we are. How many years have you been using that? Uh, I mean, since the episode came out, so... Uh, I mean, I've been DJing for almost 10 years, so probably about that long. That sounds weird to say that the Matt Smith episode with that baby and it aired 10 years ago, but also time has no meaning. So, you know, (laughs) I still remember the David Tennant and previous as like recent enough in my mind. And I forget that Matt Smith was literally on it for what, like seven, 60 years or something. Uh, like four i think i don't remember but yeah a long I time numbers all the time <laughs> i don't know why i do it for uh those that don't know um storm is a is a man of many podcasts like i i remember what was it we were in introductions or whatever for sdgc and we kind of like listen off what we do and i i I think you would like sent me a couple links i'm like oh yeah this guy has like maybe two or three no you have a lot a lot of podcasts I do. Uh, I'll keep it brief now, but yeah, I, I host four shows. I produce eight shows. Um, I also stream on Twitch, and I have no free time. <laughs> it's good to stay busy, especially nowadays. Mm-hmm. That's true. That, that is damn commendable, the amount of uh, content you push out. Thank you. I appreciate it. And I'll do my proper plugs later, I suppose. Uh, I won't clog up the early part of the episode. But but yeah, no, I uh, I started with one and then I just like I could do another and another. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's uh, co-hosted with my incredible friend, Rachel Quirky Shank, who's a comedian in New York. Um, yeah. And so those are the big ones. And then I produce a show called Shut Up Evan, which is hosted by Evan Ross Katz uh, that I sometimes talk on. And that's about queer shit and pop culture. Um, and that one's really fun. Um this Tuesday, we have an incredible episode with Tara Reid actually coming out that uh, kind of we threw oh, together God. last minute because she was like, hey, I want to come on your show. And we scrambled. And so that's going to be really fun. It was a really great interview. So, yeah, that is the briefest I could possibly talk about all the <laughs> shit I do. Uh, if you want to know more, just go to DJStormageddon.com. All of my stuff is there. 
a question for you. How the fuck do you fit all that on a on a mm. one page resume? Are you using like, like size two <laughs> to size two font? I don't. The funny thing is, I don't actually have a podcasting resume. I do have a day job um, as an executive assistant, and that's where my day job has lived. Um, but I've never actually put together a podcasting resume. But I do imagine it will be three to four pages if I actually listed everything out. Because I also didn't mention the two other shows I edit and beyond. So, like, yeah, uh, I do too much and I don't sleep, but it's fine. All right. Before we, before we go ahead and jump into our uh, game of the year list, I am contractually obligated to, uh, as Bronson is my 100th follow on uh, Twitter, I am legally bound to uh, dab for him. So let, let's get that out of the way. Uh, there you get. I, I unless guess, you, uh, unless you want like a rapid one, like <laughs> I'm okay. Just like watching that a rapid one, I'm thinking he's gonna slap something. Either a cat. I tried. I tried really hard not to. My mic is like right here. <laughs> one of your Bronson's gonna get so startled that he's gonna throw his V8 across the room. Also, also Bronson, here's your favorite energy drink, sponsored by Bronson. Yeah, there you that go. Shit, that shit can give you a heart attack. No. Down. But it Gaslighting keeps you awake. Isn't just for games, it's also for podcasts. Yeah. All right, we are back. We had some technical issues. Um, if know. this is what is being uploaded to um, to podcast services and YouTube later on, uh, let's let's do a quick little recap. Sarah, you you put your ten games. Blaine, you put your ten games. You want to listen yeah. up real quick. Uh, yeah, sure, give me one second. I'm halfway through chewing on this thing, <laughs> man. Um, oh 11 was Watch Watchdog, 10 was Hatsune Miku Project, Project Diva, 9 was Resident Evil 3, 8 was Cafe Enchante, Four, uh, 7 was Final Fantasy VII Remake, 6 was Kingdom Hearts Melody of Memory, 5 was World of Warcraft Shadowlands, 4 was Bug Snacks, 3 was Rainbow Six Siege, 2 was Darksiders Genesis, and 1 was Astro's Playroom. All right, and Blaine. Um, so mine was No More Heroes 1 and 2. Bottom, Yakuza 0 and Kiwami is the next one. Final Fantasy 7, not the remake, but the original, as well as Final Fantasy 8 um, remastered. Among Us, Final Fantasy 7 remake, Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, Doom Eternal, Animal Crossing New Horizons, and Yakuza 7. All righty. Uh, I guess I will jump back into my list then. Um yes. Uh, quickly, uh, I, I had an honorable mention of the Avengers because it had a solid single player campaign and a really well uh, crafted like single player experience. However, the live service part was garbage, more or less. It just wasn't fun. It wasn't. It didn't have enough motivation to keep playing. But that said, it's one of the best single player uh, storylines in any of the comic book games, and it made me fall in love with Kamala Khan in a way that I had not just from the other med media she's been in. Um, moving on to my number 10 is a game called We Should Talk. It's a conversation crafting um, narrative visual novel game uh, that was created by a developer. The developer's name escapes me at the moment, but uh, it's available on Switch on the eShop, and it's uh, phenomenal. If you like um, narrative games, it allows you to craft each sentence that you both text and or speak to people. And it allows you to, there are like eight different endings. It's just, it's a really cool conversation based uh, narrative visual novel game. And I, uh, it's, it's got a really cool aesthetic. The music's really good. I highly recommend it. Um, my number nine is Destiny 2 Beyond Light because I was a, a launch fan of Destiny 2 and then kind of burned, got burned out. But in the hype leading up to Beyond Light, a lot of folks talked about why, like, why the game was better, and I saw a lot of the improvements, and it got me hyped to jump back in. The storytelling is really good. Bungie is is pretty great at telling stories, and I just kind of got really sucked into it and uh, fell in love with it. Um, I have since abandoned it for replaying for playing Dragon Age Origins and two for the first time because you know why play new games when I can play old games. But that said. I'll probably go back to Destiny 2 at some point. Um, trying to keep this brief to get through everything. Um, my number eight is Animal Crossing New Horizons. I agree with what Blaine said in the possible now lost audio that um, 
Animal Crossing New Horizons is the best Animal Crossing they've made, at least for the Animal Crossing fan that I am. It had everything that I wanted, um, although I have abandoned my island for like the last four months. But I, when it came out, like for months and months afterwards, I was obsessed with it. I was playing with it. It was how I got to hang out with my friends. It's how I got to hang out with some of the folks over at SDGC. Like it was just a really great game that brought folks together. Um, and I think uh, everyone who got to play Animal Crossing, it like lifted their spirits. Like Nintendo couldn't have predicted the timing of the pandemic and Animal Crossing. However, it did work out very well for them, I feel like. Uh, my number seven game, also like Blaine, is Among Us. Uh, I know it didn't come out this year, but it hit big this year, and I played it this year so much. I've put more hours into Among Us since I started playing it, I don't know, three or four months ago, than I've put into half the games in my st- Steam list. Um, a lot of folks here on this very call I've played with and had a great time. Um, you know, I will say, Storm... Your voice changes radically whenever you're the imposter. And, like, it sure does. You. <laughs> I am a total liar. I'm a totally bad liar. Um, but yeah, no, the game is brilliant. I love the Inner Sloth team. Um, I'm really excited to see the other stuff they do. The new airship map looks awesome. Uh, but it really is. It, it's a game also. My spouse doesn't play a ton of games. She plays a lot of narrative games. She loved what remains of Edith Finch and stuff like that. You know, Walking Sims. But um she didn't grow up playing a lot of games, so having to jump into a controller with two analog sticks, it's just the controls are, t- are hard for her sometimes. But Among Us, like the minute we were told about it and she was able to download it on her phone for free and jump right in to what it was, like games with that level of base accessibility for anyone who wants to play a game is really exciting to me. She also got obsessed with Animal Crossing New Horizons for a similar kind of accessibility. Like there's no fail state, right? You're just having fun and playing the thing. And I think that's really important. Uh, shifting gears for si- my sixth choice, this game has a lot of fail states, as it is Hades. Hades is a game that I am very thirsty for on the internet. I've been bonked many a time by several horny police on the internet and have gone mm. to horny jail. I mean, they, they won't be oh. named, um, but they <laughs> might be in the top left corner of the street. But, um, but no, Hades is a really well-crafted, brilliant game that even though I don't typically like roguelikes, the way it rewards you for losing as much as for winning is a really brilliant conceit. They have a, a god mode so you, where you slowly gain damage resist after each death. So it helps you get through the game eventually, even if you're not, don't have the, the, the uh, twitchy like control skill. But it it's, looks beautiful. It sounds beautiful. The voice acting is incredible. And then all of... I would say 95% of the characters are really hot. And we all know if you follow me on Twitter, that's all I really care about is being horny on main. So, you know. <laughs> I mean, do. why do you think I play Rainbow Six Siege? For sure, <laughs> because everybody's hot. It's like, come on. <laughs> I mean, man, maybe we should have brought you on for our hottest dude of a 2020 <laughs> award. I mean, I don't know if I, I, I would say Zagarus, uh, Zach, Zagarias, I believe how, how it's pronounced, would be up there. But um, I don't know. There's something about that uh, cloud in that dress that really did it for me in a way that I wasn't expecting. Uh, And speaking of that, uh, my number five game is Final Fantasy VII Remake. Um, That is a great segue, by the way. I just want to commend you on that. It's like I do it professionally or something. Um, um, I agree with everything that Blaine has said before in the possible Lost Audio about Remake. I think that if they double down on what they're setting up at the end of Remake... It will be incredible. However, that said, I don't know that they're going to do that. But barring the <coughs> inherent racism of Barrett, the re the way we kind of reframe the avalanche and it doesn't seem like the clear good guys anymore, which that is a good thing, um, and many other things, this game was just phenomenal. Final Fantasy VII was the RPG besides Chrono Trigger that got me into RPGs. So I was going to love re- re- Remake no matter what, but I liked the bold choices. Yes, it had graphical issues. It's also got some of the best versions of Final Fantasy music across the entire series. <clears throat> I mean, gun to my head, the best Final Fantasy is actually, in fact, Chrono Trigger. It's better than every Final Fantasy. But I'm not going to pick that fight on this <laughs> podcast uh, or Ooh. any other. Ooh, <laughs> shots I love you so much. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah I Trigger. feel like, and, and I didn't mention this when Blaine was talking about it, but so I'm not going to spoil what happens in the remakes. I feel like you, you need to go in as blind as possible. But as a Kingdom Hearts fan, after finishing the remake, I 
felt like that uh, James, James, James Franco meme where he's like, first time? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I agree wholeheartedly. I'm like, hey guys, welcome, yeah. welcome to whatever the kingdom 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 hearts fan has to deal with every looks at hand nine years <laughs> i've only beaten kingdom hearts one and yet i know exactly what um wait, <laughs> that, but that's yeah, a I proper lo- place to stop by the way blunt oh, no two no. i gotta beat two and then i gotta beat three i loved three i really you can did. stop at two no Trish. i don't want to stop this two's two. the best one you can stop uh, when you hit the power uh are we talking two. about kingdom hearts no, two, two cool. would be the best one if you could skip the first two to five no, hours. You I have like a hundred hour RPG. Skip the first fifty hours. I like you, Twilight Town. You, I think it's neat. You hush about Roxas's segment. It's Storm. just me. You've it's Mars holding her once, I'm already ready to. You <laughs> I mean, to your own admission, nothing important happens in the story towards the end, anyway. So you might as well just play the last couple hours. <laughs> I'm not here to argue. This. Look, we look. accept Kingdom Hearts in this in this house, and <laughs> if you don't, I'm gonna have to ask you to leave. I criticize Kingdom Hearts all day. I'm just saying I think Twilight Town's neat. I think Rox is. I it is. criticize it because Twilight I love Town it. Is very pretty. Kingdom Hearts is one of my favorite series. It sounds like hater speak. Uh, all right, I'm look, kidding. I'm kidding. You've played. Call more me than David. I have, probably. <laughs> um, I have. I've played every game in the series except for Birth by Sleep. Um, <gasps> I know. I don't own a PSP. PSP. My God. I mean, you can play it. On don't PS4. you tell me you don't own a PSP? <laughs> it's on a fucking PS4 store. Keep on, keep on going, store. <laughs> um, Next um, on the list. Next on the list, my fourth game, and this is where they're in order of importance to me and my favorite game of the year. Um, Four was Shovel Knight King of Cards. I know it's technically not a full game, but those campaigns are pretty meaty. And uh, it was the closing of the book on the saga that's been Shovel Knight. One of my all-time favorite games. Um, It's definitely my favorite platformer ever made. Um, And King of Cards is is no exception. Um, The new mechanics they add are great. The new story is great. And then they added a card game. And I'm someone who hates card games in games and i got obsessed with this card game like i'm talking i hated the final fantasy 8 card game i hated the final fantasy 9 card game but this card game in king of cards which is not that different i think from the final fantasy 9 one i you love pretty damn accurate yeah yeah uh, i still loved it i got obsessed with it so uh, that might be the first time i've heard someone say they don't like triple triad triple and triad sucks Wow. It's garbage. Oh, wow. wow. It's Jose. it's the most garbage thing about the best game in that series. <laughs> Wait. Uh, my brain's doing a hard reset because <laughs> there's many layers. Final Fantasy to... 9 is the best game. I'm talking about Final 8. Fan... I'm talking about oh, 8. Fuck 8. It's terrible. The draw system sucks. I Sorry. Did. <laughs> another podcast another podcast another podcast um my number three funny is... game is gonna be like which is your favorite fall fantasy i'm gonna be like eight you fucking asshole <laughs> i will bring you on to fun and games to talk about final fantasy we i don't we've done a, i think we've done a series retrospective once but we have to do it more than once because there's too much to talk about okay, so i would happily do that um we talk about seven eight and brother bullshit i don't know go on i'm sorry i'm i will talk about 13 <laughs> you can talk about 13 Team. Anyway, you nice you you love my, my Shovel Knight expansion for its wild divergences in gameplay and level design, right? Yes, exactly. Um, uh, my number three game is Control, uh, which was the first oh, Remedy yeah. game I ever played. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't play Alan Wake. I played Alan Wake after Control and streamed all of it and fell in love with Alan Wake, and that's a whole other thing. But Control, there's something about... I mean, it's first of all, it's a marvel of game creation between the facial capture the storytelling the writing the graphics like it's just astonishing to me it felt like a movie but not in that cheesy way that people say uncharted feels like a movie and i love the uncharted series but like the gameplay feels very gameplay e in uncharted um except maybe the fourth one which is the most blended of them um but control like was seamless and I just wanted to know more about that world. I just wanted to know more about Jesse and and all of the other cast of characters. Control is brilliant. I don't want to talk about it more than that because anything I say will spoil this game. You have to play oh, yeah. it if you haven't played it. The only thing I will say, and to those who have played it will know what I'm talking about, I will say the words, Ashtray Maze. And that is all. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. That, that, like, like Control I love... is great when it's not running at 15 frames per second. <laughs> 
Uh, right. Even when um, I was running 15 frames, I was having a blast. Um, <laughs> I, I, I loved everything about that game, but when I got to that point that I'm referencing without being specific, it broke my brain and, and just made me elated. So anyway, play control. My number two is very specific to me because I miss live events and DJing, but Fuser changed my life when it came out. Um, I I'm just a, started that a month ago. Holy fuck. <laughs> I am a big music nerd. I am also a professional DJ. And while I don't do a ton of professional live mixing, I have, but the way that harmonics as they always have m gamifies music this is the most brilliant way they've ever done, and there are no damn peripherals. And you're talking to someone who spent over a grand across the board on all of the rock band nonsense between guitars, different games, downloadable content. Like, I was an obsessive. But Fuser, it made me miss live events in a way that I hadn't since the pandemic started. But also, it hits the right parts of my nerdy music brain in ways that i didn't even think it would like i made mixes there's one that i uploaded to twitter a little while back that i made this incredible mix that i didn't actively sit there thinking i'm making this incredible mix i did it naturally because of the way the game guides you and because of my own innate musical talent but i don't even think that was that much of a factor i think it was mostly because this game is just really well made for music mixing um and if you are any on, on any level a music nerd of any kind who likes a plethora of music you should get this game and play it it's phenomenally done it's so much fun um and and it it just again made me hungry for live events again and i even have done some twitch stream concerts where i've dj'd and it's been a lot of fun so that's my number two and finally drum roll please I'm kidding. No actual drum roll. Oh, you got fair. me all excited. <laughs> um, my number one game of 2020 is Yakuza 0. And there are a lot of reasons for it. Um, the, the biggest one is because for those who don't know, who either aren't friends with me or following me on social media, um, I lost my apartment in a fire in August. Um, it sucked. Um Mostly I lost the apartment to water damage. I am safe now. I am in a new apartment. Me and my spouse are fine. Like we're moved in. We'll be here for a while. It is what it is. When we were, we were living in the ho in a hotel for a month and it was terrible. But while we were there, I had my computer set up and I had Yakuza zero, a series I'd been meaning to play for ages. And it literally got me through the har the roughest part of that time because it's a masterful game. It's an incredible story. Um, and, it, it just, it was everything I wanted from a game that I didn't know I wanted. Um, and so I think all of those things stacked together really made an impact and got me obsessed with the Yakuza series. I've now played Kiwami 1. I've started Kiwami 2. I got 3 through 6 on PS4 uh, as a gift literally a week before they announced it on Game Pass, but it is what it is. I'll play it wherever I can. Um, I haven't touched 7 yet, but I'm doing the thing that Blaine has said they won't, they're not doing, which is uh, you just went right to seven. I I can't. My brain won't let me. I have to play all well, the games. You know for what? For what it's worth. Oh, you I'm go saying, on, Jose. Oh, I was going to say. Um, I I guess I'm a little further ahead on that timeline. I I did play zero when it, like maybe half a year after it came out, but I basically played through one, two, one, one all the way through six, like in the span of a year, and it is a hell of a freaking experience. But you can burn yourself out really fucking bad, especially since like the the game playing just like one isolated game is like so repetitive. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's a hell of a fucking trip. Just don't do what I did. <laughs> and, and I to add to that, I will say while while I think Yakuza Seven is geared to get new people into the series to not necessarily need you to play the older games, I have heard and I have even seen now on my own perspective like. There are elements that if you play the older games, you will appreciate more in seven. Just characters sure. that show up, uh, you know, those kinds of things. I've heard, uh, I'm trying to remember the spoiler free way someone described it to me. It was like, there's certain things that if you don't play everything leading up to that, even if, you know, even though this game is set up to have you get into it first, like, you may you might not appreciate exactly how it's trying to show, like, a passing of the torch or something like that. Because also, I will say, I just saw, I mean, Breaking news for the internet, but I just saw an article posted on Twitter that was from the, the Tojo Dojo or whatever it's called, saying how the voice actor of Ichiban actually 
confirmed that Ichiban will be the focused on main character going forward. This was not just like a one-off game thing. So you might actually be better, you might be right in just going through the series and then getting to seven, because I maybe there's stuff later on that like you might not appreciate as much if you haven't. I have seen, I don't, I'm not going to say specifics, I've s- accidentally stumbled across some spoiler stuff. I think it is worth playing the rest of the series. Yes. Yeah. I know there's uh, yeah. a party member who I won't name. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to talk over you. No, no I'm, just, I'm just concurring, yeah. Um, from what I, from what I know, from what I've heard, there's some stuff that just, even if all you just need is a cursory knowledge of, 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 of the Yakuza series to get to, for some of them to hit a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I know there's a party member that like, I mean, Jose, you played six, right? Or you're in I have played six. I got strong opinions. I'm going to (laughs) say there is a character involved with another character in six in a very hyper specific way that like I don't know about but he goes into detail about that I'm pretty sure is a spoiler for six I can't really say that is that. incredibly I, I don't even know what the fuck you're talking about <laughs> <laughs> I think I do he has um, white hair yeah oh yes I okay. know yes so yeah I didn't know about that, and now I'm spoiled on something for six because I played seven first. But that's besides the point. <laughs> I mean, speaking of hot dudes. Oh, but, yeah. Um, Sorry, really Star, quick, you uh, You're good. Go ahead, Sarah. Go I don't know. Oh, no. I actually I have to head out. It is extremely late where I am right, right now, and I didn't want to make this awkward. But I do have to head out. So. We love you, Sarah. I must leave. We love you, Sarah. Oh, thank thank you, you for being here. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank right. you guys. I love you too. See ya. Goodbye. Bye. Have a good Bye. Um, a- everyone badmouth Kingdom Hearts right now. <laughs> I mean, she's still. Oh no, she's deaf and she can't do shit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just to wrap up, like Yakuza Zero, I think because of when I played it, it meant a lot more. But also, um, it's just it's one of it's the mo- one of the most masterfully told stories I've ever played, especially knowing how Majima ends up. And it's, you know, at the end of that game and into the first game, like it just hit me in a way I don't think I would have appreciated Kiryu or Maz- or Majima in the first game if I hadn't played Zero. I've heard that people say you should play one and then Zero because of no, that. Fuck that. Like, yeah, I, I'll tell you I, right I, now, that's a bullshit opinion. <laughs> I, it's I love though, one, but it's a I bullshit think opinion. It's a weird criticism I have with Zero now is that. It it sets up Majima as like the uh, what, what's the word when there's two protagonists the de, the detragonist I never Deuter actually agonist. okay yes the word I can't pronounce immediately without looking at it um, <laughs> no worries <laughs> um, it, it puts him like in this super important position and like he's without spoilers Majima is prominent in the first game uh, a little bit less in the second but like after that point he's m- little bit less than a side character so i I wouldn't get your expectations too high in terms of like how often he's going to be there sure i just i like the way that the two-person story is framed i mean my boy is kiryu i love him he's my sexy boy um but also i can't imagine the final moments of um of kiwami one with nishiki meaning anything to anyone who hasn't played zero because one does not set up the emotional impact of that fi- final scene that I won't spoil. Zero does the heavy lifting for that. And so um, for what it's worth, yeah. Kiwami one does add additional cutscenes that weren't in the original, like kind of yeah. like flashbacks that kind of flesh it out. But I think you're absolutely right. Like you do not get the impact of that story. If you, if you don't play zero. Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, Plus, question. Like, when you were playing through, were well, you kind of like mainlining the, um, were you mainlining the story, or were you doing a bunch of side uh, or oh, sub stories? I did one of the side sub stories. Like, I got my chicken, real estate agent. You bet your ass, I did. <laughs> no, <Nugget! laughs> Um But that's also like, I think the thing I like about Yakuza Zero and the Yakuza series, and I promise I'll wrap up the most, is that it could have it tells the best, most serious and dramatic mainline story, while still throwing the wildest combat and gameplay and side stories you've ever seen. And I think that dichotomy of super serious and super funny is perfect. It's exactly what I love about games. And so I think that's why Zero above the other games I've played so far stands out because it does that the most. Um, So yeah, so that's my top 10 of games I've played in 2020 since like half of them weren't from this year. (laughs) 
I think that was a good thing. list. Yes. Thank you. I, sorry, I keep going. I'm the promise this will be a tangent. Um, I and I will say to add on to your point of like how much is Yakuza Zero adds to like one and then going forward. I actually feel like the fact that Majima gets so much attention in Zero, I, I, I see what you're saying, Jose, and I, I actually can't really disagree, but I also, I like the fact that because you get the added nuance to both of their characters, especially Majima, you see a character that's basically been known throughout the series as just the crazy guy who is also like clearly in love with Kiryu. Instead, he becomes this kind of thing of, he's not crazy, he, he was pushed to a breaking point of where essentially where he, he decided... I'm done playing the charade of pretending I'm a good boy, quote unquote, in order to get what I need done so I can be back in my family. I'm going to be emphatically myself, and anyone who doesn't like that can go fuck themselves. And that's what I get from Majima in Games Forward. Not a crazy person, but someone who isn't afraid to be emphatic about everything he does, and then has those moments where he calms down and is like, listen, though, we got to talk. For reference, have you played Yakuza 4? No, I've played 3, 1, 0, and I... Like, I... Through 7. I, I would still say people should play zero one like basically just play them in order, but I think playing zero first semi negatively impacts some things that unfold in four. I know what you're talking about because I was spoiled on four. <laughs> yeah. Mesa, do you is it magic conch time for you or, or should I, I guess so. should I delay it for you? I guess so. It's my magic conch for for twenty twenty. My 2020 conch time. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I did that. So that was good, beautiful. Sorry. It was well done. Anyone else that got was... any other SpongeBob sound effects? I don't. I don't. I can do a little surfer uh, laugh, I guess. <laughs> that was that was horrible. I need to like build up to it. I can't. Yeah, yeah, you can't. It's yeah, you have to feel it in the moment. I get you. Has anyone ever seen the picture of Bubble Feel Buddy where he's dummy thick and SpongeBob's about to slap the shit out of his ass? Jesus Christ! I have. Wow, okay. it's a well, good edit. It's a very good edit. That happened. Put anyway. that on your top ten list. <laughs> Sorry, Mason, you go. Bubble you're Buddy's good, good. bubble butt. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for my top ten, um, well, first things first, I have an honorable mention. Um, just because, you know, everything in my top 10 is, uh, released this year. And so, like, and I kind of have a Are rule you not of, like, breaking rules? You no. heathen. And I kind of have a personal rule of making sure to put, um, if, if a game is like, um, early access, then, you know, I, I keep it separate until it comes out and then I can put it out with everything else. So my honorable mention, because it's early access right now is uh, cyberpunk. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> <Ooh>. <laughs> it's incredible. It's the only game I've ever seen that got delayed after its release. Um, <laughs> man, we're gonna have a whole segment for this, uh, but yeah, yeah we'll keep the bird that good. That's good. Um, all right, so so number ten is gonna be um um the the three D Mario All Stars. I know the controversy around it. I get it, but the end of the day is those games mean. Those games have such a strong place in my heart mm -hmm. that they could force me like go to Tibet for them. Like they, <laughs> does Sunshine <laughs> have a strong place in your heart? Absolutely, yes. As like, like I like when I start the screen, I'm instantly in like my aunt's house and it's like 11 o'clock and I'm on the secondary TV because I'm not allowed on the main TV. And <laughs> <laughs> you what might about... break it. You might break it or fuck up a setting. You don't uh, get it. What about when you get to the hotel level and then you remember uh, that was the okay, first time yeah, you then, felt depression. Then, all right, okay. The, the hotel not, we don't talk about the hotel. <laughs> um, but yeah, those games are, are something special. Um, Number nine on my list is something that no one's really mentioned before, mentioned yet, but it came out during quarant during quarantine. It was really really good for that. It was uh, uh, Clubhouse Games. Mm, yeah, like being oh, able. Oh, I heard to, about that. Yeah, yeah, being able to you know play um, yacht dice or Uno or it's, it's, la it's called Last Card or or, or, or Ludo um, with like friends online ha was was fantastic. Um, it's it's also a good showing of the HD Rumble. On the Joy Cons, you get to feel the dice in your hand, and it feels really good. 
my friend Pix- Pixel Sickle uh, on Twitter, Ian, he was talking about that, I think, on the podcast he does with Pat Contry. Like, it's just a really fun combination of games. Um, yeah. And if you like board games and stuff like that, like tabletop games, it's just a fun time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, number eight is Bug Snacks. We've talked enough about Bug Snacks. Um, just a great, fun story game. Uh, a lot of people say um, Pokemon Snap, but I kind of disagree. I heard a personal friend call it more like uh, uh, Viva Pinata, and I think that was probably the best description of it. Like, In a like similar a- vein, Viva Pinata is a pretty fucked up game. <laughs> it's a good fucked up game. Yeah, You feed babies to other pinatas in order to procreate. How else are you supposed to get the pinatas to smash together the way you want them, Jose? Right? By not eating How children? How else do you get the dick honey hive, Jose? Jesus Christ. Wow. All right, we went That's there. a deep sure. cut. That's a fucking 10 year old plus deep cut. And, Sorry. Uh, number seven. I'm glad this is your top ten. I would not be able to fucking respond right now. Number seven <laughs> is uh is um Dragon Ball Z Kakarot. I I just love Dragon Ball Z so just, much. And I I'm one of those I'm one of those problems with, with the, the with the um with the series as and I don't don't really care that it's kind of the same thing over and over again. I'm coming every single time regardless. Um just like those pinatas. Uh, oh my god. <laughs> um, but uh, but yeah, I I just I love Dragon Ball Z, um, and it's just it's just it's just it's a, it's a very very good action RPG Dragon Ball Z game. See, because I, I I heard people like complaining about it, and like was that? Do you think I don't nothing about it beyond I know it's like an RPG and like kind of story focused play it as was, Goku. It's a little repetitive. I mean, I it loved it. Be. I have it, it also. It wasn't on my list because I didn't finish it, but, like, Mm -hmm. I loved it. I mean, I'm also, like you, a diehard Dragon Ball Z fan. Like, Mm -hmm. Piccolo is my favorite. Every version (laughs) of him, I don't care. He's the best. You can take your Saiyans and shove them. Uh, But but that said, like, yeah, it felt very much for a person like me, and so I could see how other people might get bored by it. Exactly. Perfectly it's like it's so. not going to make you a believer in Dragon Ball Z. No. Or no. Dragon Ball if you're not already. No. But if but you, you press are a big the start fan, button, it's more of what you want. You press the start button and you see the Dragon Ball rotate and you hear the starting riff of Chala Head Chala and you're already yep. you're, I'm done. You're and they recreate the entire <laughs> opening to the anime with 3D models. I'm telling you, like, Perfect. chef's kiss. Exactly. <laughs> Are you telling me I get to hear dragon, dragon, or are you telling me like the actual? Opening? No, the it's actual. Actually, yeah, unfortunately, not Rock the Dragon. I wish it was Rock the Dragon as well. <laughs> oh my god! I love Rock <laughs> the Dragon, but because you have not, taste, not the case. A uh, number six, Astro. Um, we've already talked at length about Astrobot. You know, as someone who never really felt like a PlayStation person, um, as some I was able to get a PS5, you know, day after launch, um, it felt like a like a like a coming into the fold. Like, like, come on in, bud. You know, you think especially, come on in. I think especially after what you and I went through trying to get <laughs> the fucking PS5, like, it was oh, it was all the more sweeter because of that. Oh, man, I'm surprised those, neither of y'all threw hands, I'll be real. Three, it was a mom. <laughs> what am I supposed to do? I would have defended you, Mesa. I'll I got you back. I don't care. And moms, <laughs> especially true. small moms, have a She's way of getting what they I want. I can't fucking give them more ammo. Um, yeah, so next up, number five, been on a couple lists already, Animal Crossing New Horizons. Hell yeah. Um, yeah. Been just a good time, um, especially at the beginning of this quarantine. Uh, number four for me is Ghost of Tsushima. Um, I'm, 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 I haven't quite finished it yet. Um, in fact, I'm very far from finishing it. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but so too. far it's, it's, it's. It's the exact. It feels, it feels like a critique specifically at Ubisoft. Yes. Oh my god, oh. I felt the same way when I started playing it. Like, like playing like this ooh. is what you're supposed to do. This like, is what you're supposed to feel like. It, it, yeah. That also didn't make my list because I didn't finish it, and I just I was over way of not. Uh, but but like when I got obsessed with it the first couple of hours of it. And that's exactly, exactly how I felt was like, mm-hmm. this is why I don't play Assassin's Creed anymore. Cause I want mm-hmm. this, this yeah. game. I agree exactly. completely. Um, 
I, I would have liked a lock on feature though. I will say that. <laughs> True. Fair. There, there, there are some times where it's like, it's like Sakai, Miss Lord Sakai, please. Maybe it's because I please. Doing. Maybe it's because I just doing? played Sakura like right before too. It hell threw me off. <laughs> Do the kunai at the one with the. Th- <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I got so overpowered towards the end of that game. I wasn't even using my sword. I'm just throwing fucking kunais, explosives. It was oh, ridiculous. You do a perfect yeah. parry into an instant kill and everyone just runs away. Perfect. Anyway. I need to play this game. Number three on my list is Xenoblade Chronicles Definitive Edition. Um, So, uh, I have a special relationship with Xenoblade Chronicles. Um... When I was I was originally playing the Wii version, um, when I had a Wii U, um, uh, and unfortunately I got a certain way in the game before my Wii U with that game in it was stolen. Um, I'm still pretty pretty mad about it. <laughs> um, <laughs> I bought sucks. that game used that for fifty dollars anyway. Fuck that person. Um, wait before I, before I forget, Blaine, did you ever get the Vita in the mail? Uh, I've I've kept the tracking on it. It's coming. At- Tuesday. Okay, cool. cool. You get to, you get to, you get to get the beat. Um, but um, but yeah, it's just a very, 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 very good uh, MMO like combat JRPG. Just a very, very well told story. Um, with very good characters, and it's just, it's just, it's just pretty solid. Um, all the improvements to Definitive Edition make it. The definitive edition, um, including there's even um, a special uh, side story at the very end of the game um, that I'm currently playing through right now. That just that also reveals a couple things about the, the story. Um, yeah, it's just a very very solid RPG. Um, number two on my list is Street Fighter V Champion Edition. It's just. I, a new the, the new version came out and I put it on the list. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, fighting games. What were, I love what were like games. some of the specific um, refinements or updates they did over the previous version? Uh, um, so so for Champion Edition, one of the biggest additions that they had. So Street Fighter Five has this mechanic called of uh, the V V system, a V trigger and a V skill. Um, previously, they added two V triggers. Now every character has two V skills. Um, that's a big addition. Um, another addition is that they've they've um, altered the balance of the game to the point where it's probably one of the best fighting ba- one of the best balanced fighting games ever. But do Whereas, they have Sephiroth? <laughs> that's true. They, it does not have Sephiroth. You're right. It does have Virgil though. Nice. Oh, um, shit. The costume for uh, Cody is uh, Virgil, and uh, one of his V triggers, he pulls out a bat. Instead, he pulls out Yamato. That's pretty <laughs> That's cool. Um, I need to get that version. Um, so yeah, so Street Fighter Five just continues to be. Oh, it started out being really poor, and it's, it's shown the Capcom has shown nothing but support to making it the best version of it it can be. And and that's what makes me so excited for whatever Street Fighter Six is when that shows up. Wait, important Fuck. question: Is Cody a twink or a twonk? <laughs> uh, I don't think he's a twink at all. Okay, fair enough. Damn, to Google I go. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I don't I got, know. I got he's got that good shit. boy haircut with his fucking hair outfit, though. He does. He does. He does. But I feel like he's too. He's too. He's too large, right? So maybe he's more like Twonk leaning on Hunk, I guess. Yeah, you know, yeah, that's that. I, yeah, I like that description, but better because because Prison accurate. Cody is definitely like just not Twink. I could, I, I agree with that hundred percent. Yeah. yeah, I, I see no like, definitive I don't, answers. I don't, think, I don't think I don't think throwing rocks is a very Twink-like attribute. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, I can introduce you to some Twinks too, like. <laughs> 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 Oh god! Right, next I'm sorry. Right. I keep derailing this. And, and number one on my list. If you know me, you probably could have guessed it. It's Miles Morales. Sure. Spider-Man yeah. games. Miles Morales is just more Spider-Man, but it's black this time, so it's better. Yeah, I would agree. <laughs> when they said that game was on PS5, I was like, now I need to get a PS5 because I care. I mean, I love Peter Parker, yeah. but like, I, I oh, don't yeah. know. 
I want to see Miles get more play because he seems so interesting. To me. Spider-Man, I, Spider-Man was the reason why I had to get a PS4. M- M- Miles became the reason I had to get a PS5 day one. I think, mm. I I think every of our awards that Spider-Man got were like very well justified and well earned. Mm-hmm. But the, because if you want to count Blaine as the honorary fifth member, since uh, she's been on basically like five <laughs> or six episodes at this point out of ten. Um, I, I now will never judge any outlet for voting a specific way for a game of the year awards, because it, a lot of it does come down to what mostly everyone has played. Yep. Uh, I was basically the only one that played doom. It didn't win shit. Yep. <laughs> and, and everyone I, played miles and miles uh, deserved those awards. But I was the only one that didn't play, uh, last of us. I didn't feel like it barely won anything either. Yeah, it lost best lost uh, best story to Miles. I mean, I'm yeah. not blaming anyone, but <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, happy with that result, and you yeah, all know why. That's my, um, yes, YouTube.com. So I don't know what the fucking URL for that video is. I'll post uh, it. Whatever. I yelled about it a lot, and Jose let me do it. Put it up <laughs> as its own thing. I really like that discussion. I think it's one of the best things. Uh, on the internet it's the only time it I, it's, it. it's one of the oh thank you it's one of the few times that i've gotten to like get in a heated debate with someone who i know disagrees with me on a lot of points but like didn't do that thing of like i don't know didn't do that thing of like okay i'm gonna pretend i listen to you but here's my point you just kind of let me go and that was cool well i feel like for most of that discussion it was uh it's important to get the voice from someone who's actually affected by these things. So I'm just going to mm-hmm. shut the fuck up and let the person who actually has perspective go and say like, whether people agree or disagree, they can take those um, kind of after the fact, but there, there is infinite amount of wisdom coming from Blaine in that entire uh, segment. Basically what we ask of our cis allies is just learn to shut the fuck up when we tell you and everything will be okay. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Shutting the fuck up's pretty easy. I do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the link for that for anyone that's interested. Wait, is that the right one? I mean, did I fuck oh, up? Gosh. No, I didn't fuck up for once in my life. <laughs> uh, speaking of fuck fucking up, let's jump into uh, my top ten, the uh, the good list with all the right answers that are <laughs> that is indisputable. Where the fuck did I put my list? Oh no. Oh shit, everybody, we ran out of time. We can't go over. Yeah, we gotta go. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks for listening to the Game Session <laughs> Podcast. <It's over. laughs> All right. Um, so here's my wow. top 10 of the list. I do have an honorary. I, I thought I would be the only one, but everyone stole my thunder. <laughs> That's oh, I don't have an hurt. honorary. I just put 11 on my list because I don't care. <laughs> Breaking well, the actually, rules. I, think I, I don't know. Um, go on, I'm sorry. My number 11 is Persona 5 Royal. I put it honorary because it's. 95% of that is basically just Persona 5. Um, all the additions they made um, just to the combat and the way that Personas have extra uh, skills and whatnot. There, there's just a lot of nice tuning refinement similar to what happened in Persona 3 um, FES and then also Persona 4 Golden. It's pretty similar to that. Um, oddly, I don't much care for the extra semester that they did. Because it gets, because Persona Five already has a pretty solid conclusive ending, and this just kind of staples another forty hours on top of that. And there's there's, there's more stuff like kind of strewn throughout like the main part of the game, but to have like this nice clean conclusion, then just throwing another thing on that that arguably has a worse conclusion, even if it is enjoyable, just kind of leaves a sour taste in my mouth. And plus, that's. I think I put 200 hours into it, so at least I got my money's worth. <laughs> Didn't Persona you play the... Having... Oh, go on, I'm sorry. sorry. Oh, no, no, you're good. I was going to say, Persona having an unnecessarily added-on thing that brings down the overall narrative, I never would have guessed. Not See, a so very like... tight narrative. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Persona? Not a very tight... Na- I'm sorry. Fans at home, I don't really like Persona, so I kind of shit on it a lot. But I do, I won't shit on people that enjoy it as long as you don't excuse the gross shit in it. I do want to play one and two, though. I hear they're pretty rad. Well, two. I hear one's a. It, it's play. weird. There's the Persona three, four, and five. They never released one and two. It's kind of weird. It's, 
it's funny for like <laughs> oh so so five was my first persona and it's funny like how much of the parts that made it persona were the parts i disliked the most wait what didn't you like like the time limit um uh um s links all that stuff but the, the actual rpg which which it was the most of the Persona games like SMT was the part I liked the most. So I think um, I just like SMT. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for me, it was kind of whenever I'm pl- invested in, cause uh, the game's basically cut in half into like, here's the social sim part. And then the, mm-hmm. here's the um, RPG part. And I like both of those fairly equally, but uh, both sections can drag on depending on how efficient you are with uh, digging through the dungeons. Yeah. So there, there'll be times where I'm doing nothing but social stuff for five hours because I already cleared the dungeon in that mm-hmm. specific time limit. There's yeah. other times I'm doing a dungeon for 10 hours. I'm like, fuck, I could really just go for some social stuff. Um, yeah. Pa- pacing. Uh, the word pacing does not exist in that mm-hmm. fucking series. No. It is not a thing. So I, I do wish it was a little bit more fully full press turns that like the press turn light of the combat system but uh yeah persona 5's good game I give a respect give, oh sorry give give the graphic designer a fucking raise that's all absolutely. i'll say oh absolutely like if there's absolutely. one thing i'll never give persona as a series shit for is they always have their designs the i don't know that artist's name but who does who's done the design work like since i think two or three like all looks or even earlier like it all looks great um, and I will show respect to Persona 5 Royal for taking out a phobic um, I wish there was more done with care of the overall narrative. I've gone on and on about... I promise I won't tangent. I've <laughs> gone on and on about the fact that I think it's fucked up that a game so centered around like youth being uh, discriminated against, treated horribly, flat out abused, literally having like one of the first people you fight is like a teacher who's a sexual predator of his students. And then that game has a romance mechanic with one of your teachers. It just feels like not. Cool. Yeah. I get that it's, it's a Japanese gross. trope, but I don't care if the character is technically 18 or not, or if it's indetermined, mm-hmm. that's fucked up. It's still but, power dynamics at play and it's grooming. Exactly. It's not fucking right. Exactly. The but I, I respect that positive too. things are changing. Oh, sorry. Um, Mesa, what'd you say? No, you're fine. I was just saying like the power dynamic in that specific um, link is weird too. Yeah. Oh, I also want to so say, awkward. I, um, yeah. if, if you romance, uh, Futaba, who is essentially oh. your surrogate little sister, yeah, you're, uh, right. you're Ooh. fucked up. Ooh. That's all I'll say. <laughs> yeah, those... I didn't even know about that. Those and I was literally are... like, maybe I'll play it at some point okay. with a critical eye. And now I don't even want to do that. Okay. Uh, that. Just see. So you... Hey, I'm gonna say something. It's bad. The the most annoying Persona Five people are the people that romance Futaba. Yeah, like, <laughs> Futaba the nerd with the long yes. hair. Yeah, yeah. So the one Hikikomori. who looks like she's fucking thirteen or twelve, but she's yes. like, I guess she's seventeen. I don't know. No, no, she's. I think she's like in middle school or something. Are you serious? No, 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 wait, not middle school, wait. like early high school. Like, like you're no, no, she, like I, if I recall she's correctly, nine. she's like in middle school going to high school. That's still gross. Absolutely. Yeah, it, it's just like a whole surrogate little sister just like, yeah, no, I'm I'm good. <laughs> That'd be like if in Persona 4 you could romance Nanako. Uh, there's people that want that shit. I, I, know. I I'm, know. I'm sorry we're freaking you out, Storm. <laughs> no, you're not freaking me out. I'm just like, wow. I, yeah. I, every time I think the Persona fan base as a whole can't get it. Makoto's good, no though. No offense to people I, present. I like promise the game is fun, Storm. Please play. Just don't Makoto's do bad romance. I burned out on Persona 5, the original, when I had it. I played it for like uh, 15 hours, and I just it didn't grab me in the way that I thought it might. I'll go back to it eventually, but I, the problem is I need short games. I have too many long games to play. If a game is a hundred hours, if a game is a hundred hours, I don't play it. Cause I just, I, who has a hundred hours to spend on games? I have too much. I have like eight podcasts. I have to edit. Who has time for that? I'm, I, 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 I hate to admit, uh, if you want to count the original persona five, I've played, the, I've, pl- I've played it three times. Oh, Jesus. I, like I mean, that's fine. I've also each. replayed the mass effect trilogy eight or nine times. So like we all have our thing, right? Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Well, my dad works in Nintendo. We can get, get you banned from Xbox. <laughs> 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 anyway, going down Excited for scramble. Excited for, I am excited for scramble though. Scramble does look cool. Mm-hmm. It's a nice that's, persona five too. That's how I liked my eggs. 
<laughs> Same, oh, bro. Blaine, I meant to tag you in a Twitter thing. We were going on a little pun frenzy uh, relating to eggs. You gave up. Uh, What's yeah, up with I that? Busy that day. <laughs> Says the pun loser. Oh my goodness! I, I was. How about that angry. list? I was pretty ecstatic about it. Um, num- number 10, um, I'm going to go with Jedi Fallen Order, which, you know, technically came out last year, but we were doing our awards um, kind of like in the same similar fashion as uh, the Game Awards. Um, honestly, I think it's just been too much time since I've played it to, like, vividly remember every single detail, but it is a damn solid Metroidvania souls-like game and it feels weird mm-hmm. to like kind of reduce it down to those terms especially when there's like so much personality to it with the story and the environments that you're traversing but it's just a damn solid game and i would recommend jacking that difficulty up to whatever you're kind of comfortable with because playing it just like on what's kind of a breeze i doesn't really defeat the narrative purpose i don't think those two are really necessarily conjoined but i think it will be a better experience if you leave enough room of a challenge for yourself. Um, also, the double lightsaber, fuck yeah. Yeah. That Hell deserved yeah, a higher yeah. best moment than it got. Oh, it's it's so... It's just... Because the fact you just, like, a... you just stumble across, you're like, oh, shit. Yeah. Now you can get it way earlier than you're supposed to. I'm going to play it. It's like looking it's for phenomenal. something in your fridge. And you I really loved it. Dinner. Let's see. Full Number nine dinner. is uh, Gears Tactics. The story's kind of whatever, but... I'm a sucker for XCOM. I'm a sucker for Mario and Rabbids, which, you know, I think people still slept on that game. That game's fucking phenomenal. It's great. I have it on my Switch. It's fun as hell. Just upgrade your character so you can do, like, hell it dash damage. You don't even have to fire a gun. It's beautiful. <laughs> um, but Gears Tactics is a really solid... Um, I almost said RTS. Uh, strategy <laughs> game. And... Um, and like so, so some of the divergences it makes away from XCOM is, um, I, no, I guess I do still have separate classes, but there's a much bigger emphasis on using the ability Overwatch, where you know if anyone moves within your line of sight, so you get a free action. And kudos to uh, actually giving over over uh, watch a defined like cone of vision and XCOM. It's really freaking vague. I believe there's mods you can use to like tell exactly like what um what the range is for both you and enemies but um just just kind of like falling in line with how uh maybe not the multiplayer for gears since everyone's dashing around with a shotgun like a jackass but at least (laughs) in the campaign yeah you know it's people hiding behind every franchise should have an isometric tactic spinoff like gears tactics or mario versus rabbit oh Um, fuck yeah they they sell themselves and you know crazy people like me love to play them even We've, I've played like I've played and beaten XCOM two, and I've played and beaten XCOM one, and I'm gonna get Mechanicus at some point. And I have Mario and Rabbids, but I haven't dipped too far into it yet. And I'm gonna play Gears Tactics when I replay the series. I may have a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a really solid one of those. I played it on PC. Uh, the controller support was not great at the time I played it, but now that it's out on um, Xbox, I would imagine it's a bit more tidied up there. That might be the better way to play it um it's it's a little bit lower on the list just because the final boss is very tedious it can take very it can take a real long time to get through it and uh there's a lot of artificial pacing in the story because there's story missions and then there's side stuff um i don't know if they know what the definition of side missions are because they're mandatory in order to complete the game so it's just like the most artificial pacing that you could put in there. Oh, and it's like it's it's kind of meant to give you upgrades and level your characters up. But I was already maxed out. So I'm just like, well, fuck, I don't want to do these missions. Just let me play the story ones. In it, and you just, you just can't. It's, it's uh, like if they force you to do that thing you can do in XCOM where you'll just move around to pass time purposely so you can research things, even though all you have to do is just play the last mission and beat the game. Exactly. Uh, number eight on my list is Resident Evil 3, which I believe you also had on yours, Blaine. Oh, yeah. Um, just a really solid uh, entry in the series. It's It doesn't hold that, that special charm that the Resident Evil 2 remake did. It's much more linear. There's like some kind of open, open hubs. Um, I did actually enjoy the dodge feature a lot, especially when I accidentally did my nightmare run challenge before I got like any of the defense up or like any of the special items you're supposed to be using. Um, so the final boss was one hit 
and I'm just dead. So I had to get the the dodging precisely every single time in all of uh, the final bosses, like tentacle whips. Uh, that was a good five hours of my life at at three in the morning. <laughs> I didn't I have to do the that. hardcore run through, and I only bought like oh, there, I bought. There, I'm sorry, oh, go go on, sir. I was just going to say, like, there, there is so much worse than than hardcore in there. Trust me. No, I believe it. It gets so bad. Well, because, like, I got up to, I think, the acid fight with Nemesis on hardcore, and I don't know if I've soft locked myself or not because I have, like, I, uh, I don't know. Just, like, I did, I bought, like, the, I bought things instead of buying the items that make boost your stats, I instead, like, I bought the bolt cutters and I bought the lock pick so I could just do all that in the beginning and just grab everything, not realizing it's not really a good idea to try and do speed run in hardcore as well as, like, just trying to beat hardcore. I should have done that on, like, normal or something. Yeah, especially since you only have, like, so many challenges you can do to, like, accumulate those points mm-hmm. and, um... I unfortunately made the decision to get all the achievements for it on the Xbox version, which means I had to sit in that stupid set piece. You're in the hospital as Carlos, and uh, you're just getting swarmed by base zombies. Because one of the challenges is like, I don't know, get 10,000 kills with an assault rifle. So I had to keep reloading that checkpoint for like five hours (laughs) and just keep unloading it. It, it wasn't a fun yeah. platinum, and I did it anyway. I, I fucking hate myself for that. <laughs> uh, number right seven there. is uh, Miles Morales. I think we've kind of elaborated that on last podcast. It's just a really fucking solid game. I have no real solid complaints against it. Uh, number six, and I feel like more people really need to play this. Uh, Ori and the Will of the Wisps is a fucking beautiful game. It's the... And I really enjoy the change for from the uh, combat from the original because the original your default attack was a little orb that would follow you around it's just kind of launching little homing attacks and you can move around the entire time it doesn't mess with your movement it's completely independent of yourself so there's basically no moment in combat where you should stop just mashing the x button um they changed that up in ori 2 where um the i guess the closest equivalent to what it feels like is if you've played Mega Man X, it feels like you're playing like zero, except your sword has a much longer range and mm-hmm. it feels fucking phenomenal to play with. And you get a whole bunch of other upgrades. You can customize uh, basically what your offensive capabilities are. And I, th- I believe you can change them on the fly if you or no, maybe there's more of a hard locked menu you have to go to. I, d- I don't recall, but it's it's fucking beautiful. Made me cry. That ending is something else. And uh, it's on Game Pass, so you can play it on Xbox and you can play it on PC. It's also on Switch. Um, I don't think anyone really has an excuse not to play it. And it's you don't even need to play Ori 1. You can just jump straight into the second one. It's better on essentially every single front. Uh, Let's see. Number five is Astros, which we've talked about at length. Uh, My number four could also easily be my number one in the sense that it is the most unique experience that I've had that these nothing else on this list was able to give. And that's Among Us mm-hmm. specifically because um, I had always kind of been a lurker on forums, whether it's Reddit or Reset Era or whatever. So I was never really part of like like a part of the community. But jumping into the SDGC community um, back in August, just let me meet so many uh, kind and caring people they're like enthusiastic about games such as Blaine and um, and Matt here and so it was kind of the perfect storm for me at that that moment that Among Us was was picking up I believe in October is when it kind of really jumped off mm-hmm. and there, there's nothing quite like just jumping in a room with nine friends and it's just a social deception game being able to lie to each other like learning the ins and outs Um, there's nothing quite like knowing for a fact that you're a crewmate and everyone still suspects you anyway, and you have to try to talk your way out of it. You're in the wrong place at the wrong time. Like you stumble across a body. It's just like, what, what do I do? You see, the problem uh, though, is when you make statements like I saw so-and-so, I I learned from that. I learned so hard. I found out that you didn't actually see the event. You just assumed they did. Yeah, I have to bring this yes. up every time you bring yes. it up. Yes, for what it's worth, that was my second time playing, and in other servers that I play in, I am basically Bronson 2.0. I am very glad. Oh, good. Okay, I, I freaking I freaking clutched um, the last game we had played too. 
damn. Just Among Us, especially if you're playing on mobile, it's just it costs nothing to get into it. And it's even oh, on yeah. Switch now, too. Correct. Oh, yeah. And Game Pass. On Switch. It, yeah, and it's on Epic. Game Pass. Epic Store, too. Or it's going to be on Game Pass soon, or it's already on? No, it's on Game Pass right now on um, PC. And then on Xbox, it's going to be, I think, early 2021, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, And uh, we might not be able to get to the news story, but uh, Fortnite trying to come for Among Us with their Spy Within mode, which is basically just emulating it. Uh, fuck off, oh. Fortnite. Let Among Us be its own goddamn thing. <laughs> well, let's, you already have enough money. Let's also but, be fair to, like, um, I forget what company, uh, Overkill. They made a game, or the, I don't know, the company that made Overkill, or I can't remember if they, they're, they're called Overkill. They made a game called Impossible Spaceman that came out a week before... Well, among us got big and it's basically the same thing yeah, yeah. and it's yeah. really unfair <laughs> i've heard it's fun but i'm also like number one literally not that what you just said but also number two i this is allegedly because i haven't i i've seen a few screenshots but i haven't looked deeper into it like apparently the the guy who created it or like the mate lead dev might be a total creep i've mm. seen some screenshots of him like jumping in people's dms like i'm gonna jump in that yeah. oh shit yeah. But anyway, but yeah. Uh, Among more Us verification is verification just... is needed before I make a hard statement. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Among Us has just been a special game that nothing else on this list has been able to emulate. So in many mm-hmm. ways, it's actually number mm-hmm. one. But for now, it's just oh, yeah. on four. Uh, number three would be the Final Fantasy VII remake. Um, it feels cliche to say it, but seven was my favorite gro- growing up. At least until I learned that nine is actually the one true uh, Final Fantasy god. You're allowed. Uh, I'm sure. allowed to be right. I understand. Yeah, you are allowed to be right. <laughs> yeah, you didn't think I was going to fucking be like, oh, yeah, no, I mean, you're right, though. Like, I'm not going to deny that. Even though it's not my favorite, I nine is like a turning point in the series of back to fantasy, but still keeping the quality of life improvements that they had going forward. So I am not going to argue that. Boom. Yeah. That um, just happened. The, the changes to the um, more action RPG versus traditional, um, I, I guess Final Fantasy VII, the original, wasn't exactly turn-based. It's the uh, ATB system. But um, I, I'm just surprised how well it still Semantic. worked. And, uh, yeah. Basically. <laughs> and um, it, it's basically Crisis Core on crack. Yes. And yeah. just like all the presentation, the story's on point. Like you, could, People can have their complaints on... Um, you could you could say condensed nature and that the game is only up until after you're about to leave Midgar. But you could also call it bloated because they do have to bloat that up to about I, I don't recall how long it took me to beat it, like hours, like forty hours or so. Yeah. yeah. Forty if you take your time, but you could probably blast through it in like twenty if you really yeah. want to. But uh, the entire time I just had a smile on my face. Like this is my like I can be biased, this is my fucking childhood, but I think on the gameplay front, on the story front, it just excels in every single department. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, that ending, though. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, yeah. I want to see. I want to see if I can phrase this in a way that is not a spoiler. Like the word "remake" in the title is. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like. Yeah. Like, like, I mean, like, like something, okay, something crazy that I saw someone, well, I thought it was crazy, and now I believe 100%, is the whole idea of, like, oh, I think that Final Fantasy Remake is a sequel to Advent Children. You play the game, and you rewatch it, because I rewatched Advent Children Complete recently, and re- realized, wow, that movie holds up so much better than I expected it to, mm. and... At least the complete version. Yeah, the complete version. The original, I think, is fine, but yeah, I, there's... There's stuff in the complete one, including like the weird, like no blood in the original release, and now the blood in this one. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think I think Final Fantasy Remake is literally a sequel to Advent Children, oh, and I will not be taking any other questions at this time. <laughs> All true Final Fantasy VII fans know that uh, not the worst entry in the series, Dirge of Cerberus, actually has the furthest events chronologically that would lead to more uh, Genova nonsense. I mean, they put stuff from Dirge of Cerberus into Seven Remake, so that's kind of mm-hmm. bananas. Makes yeah. me so angry. Like, I love it. Vincent is my favorite character in the game. Dirge of Cerberus sounded so amazing, and then I actually played the damn thing. And oh, it's hot trash, you know, but I, you know, I wanted to throw it. my PlayStation out the window. When I played it as an edgy teenager, I thought it was the fucking shit. You yeah, like you were Gakko. very wrong. You don't like Gact <laughs> being a prominent fucking player at I the mean, very, very end of the game? 
to be fair, Spoiler I was also Cerberus. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, I was also playing Shadow the Hedgehog at around the same time. Ugh. Oh yeah, my soul. I love Shadow the Hedgehog. It's one of the best reward <laughs> systems in, in video games. <laughs> Obviously. Yeah, the better game you do, the less of the game you play. Yeah. With the chaos control. Chaos control. And you oh, just skip halfway through the level and you're done. <laughs> That's how you know it's good. Yeah. <laughs> time savers. <laughs> Yeah. But before my, but it's a time saver you don't have to pay for. It's even better. Well, I I don't know if the next game on this list meets the uh, the gravitas of the story of Shadow the Hedgehog driving around in a motorcycle with a gun. Insane, damn. But uh, Last of Us Two is taking uh, Last of Us Two is c- kind of tied with the first game on this list. It can kind of go either way because they're both up there for completely opposite reasons. Mm-hmm. Um. Mm. I, I know we've kind of gone in length about a lot of the issues with The Last of Us 2 in previous videos. Uh, one of them is linked in the chat. And um, for for me, it's def... It's not like the... I, I've never understood the, the complaint about like, oh, Naughty Dog gameplay is bad. I think it's serviceable. It's not going to feel like you're playing Call of Duty in terms of like the snappiness. It is what it is. It's action survival horror. Um... But for me, it all just comes down to the story and the emotion that it's able to convey to you. And mm-hmm. without going into spoilers, it it's able to make you feel ways about certain perspectives in a way that a movie, the way that a book would never be able to emulate. And for the climax, um, for the theater uh, event, to, to be vague about it, uh, that's probably going to be one of my most favorite moments in a game for for fucking years to come. Like the fact that it, it was able to. Uh, I mean, before that, it was still making me kind of flip perspectives to be on the opposite end of things. But that was just like the, I, I was conflicted at that moment, and then what also happens at the end. But the fact that I was down for what was about to happen from the other perspective. I think that says a lot about the writing in the game. And I, I know there's kind of like um, parallels to that. I think, Blaine, you had mentioned uh, there's some uh, near stuff or some other uh, Yoko Taro stuff that um, does similar things to different effects. Yeah. Here's here's possibly the nicest thing I'll ever say about The Last of Us 2. And it's, it might sound like a backhanded compliment, but I genuinely think that way. The Last of Us <laughs> 2 is very, very good like you said, at getting you to feel the way it wants you to feel. And it even is very good at getting you to stop, to stop automatically inserting yourself into the player character or the main character and have you actually kind of go, wait, do I want to be on this person's side or not? I think it ultimately fails at what it sets out to accomplish just personally, but I don't deny that it did at least have me up until it did. If that makes any sense. That mm-hmm. does. Absolutely. And I, again, I'm not going to go on about the trans stuff. I, that's in the video that Jose posted, um, as well as my issues with the poor narrative. Go, But, um, and, you know, uh, my problems with that, my problems with uh, Neil Druckmann, being a shithead on Twitter aside, um, <laughs> I think that the people on the the base level that really that wanted to make something special did a good job. Um, I would even, uh, as a note on the the gameplay thing, I would actually say if anything, the gameplay is too good, and I would like to see it dialed back to something that doesn't that doesn't clash with the narrative theme. I really liked. I, I know uh, in my video, I kind of like compared it to like the uh metal gear solid five stealth where you know you're kind of like throwing yourself on the ground hiding in yeah. bushes going like you under like cars feel and whatnot the thud visually as you see you do it mm-hmm. um so like a lot of that stuff was really good like the, like the impact uh the way that enemies react to, to being hit wherever they're where they're getting shot or whether it's a blunt object or whatnot mm-hmm. but um i think my biggest complaint non-story wise would basically I, I, I guess you can you could call it story it's just the pacing. There's a lot. There's, there's way too many like open ended spaces. There's nothing going on. You can argue like, yes, you need that pacing from story beats because that way you can come down. So that way when something does happen, it's more exciting that way. Um, and, and people often point to the 
pacing issues towards the end of the game. That's one specific part where I don't mind it whatsoever because I feel like that's the intended effect. Um, but enough I about love last. We really do have like polar opposite takes on this game. I really do. Like, you know I, mean, I love no you. No sarcasm, of course. <laughs> Um, but yeah, number one on the list, and uh, I had a little mini rant printed out somewhere because, and I, this is this is not anything personal against like anyone in the gaming sphere whatsoever. I guess it's just more is disheartening the word I want to use. Um, no one in the critic sphere, like any of the podcasts I really listen to, and I listen to way too many podcasts. That's all I do at work for eight hours a day. Well, <coughs> nowadays with the holiday stuff, I'm working like 10 hours a day. Um, uh, Doom Eternal, like no one is really talking about it. And like, I, I want to say like giving it the credit for what it's doing from like a pure game design point of view. Like it is hands down one of, not one of, I, I, I believe that it's the most tightly designed games of not just this year but not just this generation like games of all fucking time like the way every single system intermingles with each other whether it's the, it's the glory kills it's the dashes the blood punch uh the way that specific weapons and way specific weapon mods are um they have their strengths and tackling certain enemies the way you have different challenges um collectibles and whatnot like everything is just so intermingled together and it just it's just such a freaking cohesive package where like yes there is a lot of stuff you do have two different kinds of grenades you have a flame belt you have a sword you can use and it can feel a little bit too much with everything coming at you at once but once you master it and maybe it's because i I've, I've played a lot of mmos where your skills are kind of like on a cooldown. so if you're able to manage them and chain them in very specific ways especially with certain weapons um you can pull some really crazy shit off. Like you can go up towards an enemy who has a AOE attack that, that they do. If you get close to them, like they launch it on the ground. So it's not like immediately in their face. So you can, let's say you, you can jump, use a grapple on the shotgun to launch yourself towards them, shoot them. They're about to launch the thing on the ground. You can uh, dash back and then hook back in. You can jump to other things, chain glory kills. It's, it's just such a fucking beautiful, uh, cohesive shooter. And it feels weird. Like, like the story is cool. I wouldn't say it's like, t uh, top tier stuff. Um, I know Blaine touched on it a little bit earlier. Um, but it just like, e like even like in best action, I feel like it kind of got robbed. I mean, it, it did get nominated and that in that and of itself is a pretty damn high award, but it, it feels like it kind of got bypassed by. Grant's I mean, I over. loved Doom mm -hmm. 2016 and I played it for the first time back in February of this year and fell in love with it. I thought it was phenomenal. And I just never picked up Eternal. And I don't think it was because I didn't want to play it. It's on Game Pass on PC now, so I'm going to play it. But I think I, think I just thought I got what I wanted from Doom 2016. And what I've heard is Doom Eternal is better in every way. Uh, but I haven't played it yet. But I, your your impassioned plea about it definitely makes me more interested to get to it. And I don't think I'm going to get to it till next year. But you know, uh, uh, Doom Eternal, Doom 2016 made me remember that I like first person shooters because I'd forgotten. You know, I haven't played a lot of them lately, and it reminded me that they can be really tight and really fun. And yeah. I've heard that Doom Eternal is just that plus more. I think because um, so that, that came out in 2016 alongside Titanfall 2. And I would say like those two games are responsible for actually breathing new life into the genre. Mm -hmm. And I would argue Doom more so just because it's more hyper specific. It's not about aiming down your sights. It's about running around as fast as you can, um, jumping all over the place. And it's just so special for that. I remember when like Doom Eternal first came out and seeing... Um... Sunil Legend on Twitter, like posting because Sunil Legend would post like Devil May Cry stuff and like other character games like built around either character action or like whatever you would classify like a god a god hand as like those kinds of games mm -hmm. with all character these cool action. combos. Yeah, yeah, and um, like doing that same thing with Doom Eternal, and you just seeing these like you described the combos you can say, but like it, it's like it, it's it's a marriage of so many cool things, and um. Like, actually, uh, ironically enough, like, today, 
I mentioned this before the podcast, but uh, it's important. It's actually worth bringing up now. I just like a day ago bought the um, Night Dive port slash. I want to almost, almost call it a remaster, but I don't know if you would call it that. Of, of Blood, and um, I have not had this much fun playing a first-person shooter in a long time. And it actually made me remember. It made me realize, like, aside from like Doom Eternal. And again, like I didn't play Titanfall too, but I've heard I've heard exactly what you're talking about, and I, from what I've seen, I agree. I've seen those those bones in Apex Legends, even though I've really not played that extensively at all. Like, it's not that FPS is a bad genre; it's that the whole genre seems to be so oversaturated with just what is a Call of Duty like or what is a Medal of Honor like, and nothing else. Mm-hmm. That like when you get a Doom Eternal or a Titanfall 2 slash Apex Legends, or you play this port of a game that came out in, like, the 90s, like, you're sitting there going, holy shit, I thought FPS games were all the same and suck. But no, they're actually really fun when you and can mm-hmm. use interesting game ideas with them, or design ideas with them. I completely I forgot to mention, um, I think uh, John ja- Muncher had mentioned this, uh, Doom Eternal has the perfect format for a new metroid prime game there's like Mm. so much like you can just go through it like as a linear shooter if you really want to but looking at that map seeing where the secrets are trying to like deduce where they are if you have if you don't have that skill unlocked it does feel a bit like a metroidvania game even if you're not necessarily going back with new tool sets like previous levels but it also i i think you could unironically put doom eternal down as one of the best platformers of the year because there's so much of it even more so than um than uh, Doom 2016, and combining that in like in the middle of of uh, fights too is it's fucking beautiful. Grabbing the walls and then mm. grabbing a pole and then grappling hook with super shotgun like, uh, such good yeah. shit. Seemed like yeah, seemed like Doom 2016 helped yeah revive the the boomer shooter uh, genre of <laughs> FPS. <laughs> um, I keep I, forgetting I loved... that's a term. I love to see how um uh, uh turn back in my day. Well, yeah, like actually, like actually, back in my day, the gun was in the middle, like <laughs> like big fat, like actually. And Eternal has that mode where you can put the gun in the middle, which I think is pretty funny. I know it's so good. It's charring, but it's great. <laughs> All right, we. Uh, how are you doing on time, Storm? You got more I, time to go. It's getting a little late where I am. Uh. Uh, since we've been we've been at it for two hours, um, so if y'all have to keep going, I may have to bow out. Uh, but that's up to y'all and how you want to uh, proceed. Um, I think we could maybe do ten to fifteen minutes of cyberpunk if you guys want to go over that, then we can call it. Sure. All right. That sounds good to me. All right. So I originally had. A article describing some of the cyberpunk stuff but there's uh how should i put this there's too much fucking shit going <laughs> on with cyberpunk it is a complete fucking pr nightmare it's and even cool. even aside from like all the transphobic shit that's gone on like through the marketing whether it's through the cyber official cyberpunk uh twitter accounts the uh racist dog whistles uh both when both within and outside the context of the game um so, so on PC, the game is considered a uh, air quote critical critical success with a Metacritic score of eighty nine. Uh, Metacritic is kind of not a good barometer in the sense that sites that are more critical tend to not have. Um, they don't tend to have review scores. They just have the body of text to be exemplary of their thoughts. Mm-hmm. Um, so, Metacritic as a result tends to skew a little bit higher. And so on, on PC, if you can get a 3080, which uh, no one can fucking manage to do that right now, the game looks great. There's some bugs and glitches. That's fine. The console version, on the other hand, um, at least at the time that I made these notes, has a 52 on Metacritic. That is a 37 fucking point difference. Like sometimes you'll see like maybe two or one, but this is 37. Yeah. And that's due to poor performance on the um, last gen consoles. Uh, it's just like really bad graphics. There's a lot of crashes. Um, Mesa, I think you might have been the only one here that's played it now that Sarah's gone. Do you want to go ahead and uh, regale your your adventures? 
Along um, with your fantastic car t- suddenly turning into another car and then another car <laughs> falling out of the sky for no reason. Oh, it's and you, for reference, you're po- cars and people when you sorry. Oh, did we did we mention the people and cars that disappear when you turn around? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, that, that, that stupid to... workaround. <laughs> but uh, for reference, this... Mesa, you are playing this on your PS5. Yes, so I this am. is not the version so, that many others were experiencing. So, 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 um, what I basically get is I get the higher resolution, the the PS4 Pro plus 60 FPS. Okay. So, um, it's 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 it's, it's, it's actually playable. <laughs> um, uh, well, so far. Uh, I, actually, the the Xbox Series X is the best console version. Um, because that's what the, I've uh, heard. It even lets Xbox, you choose between resolution and performance mm-hmm. mode. As well as the Xbox One X model has a higher, um, uh, higher po- uh, like like city population than PS4. Oh, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so that even transfers over to the the higher end consoles. Um. So far, my biggest complaint of, of in terms of performance, if we're just purely about how a video game works. The crashes have been non-stop. Um, it's so frustrating it, to the point where if or I literally I'm driving and I'm like you know, I feel like a crash is gonna happen, and about ten minutes later, it happens. Um, how would you describe it like as on par compared to like maybe a Bethesda title? It feels like it feels like it feels like with us the title before their day one patch. Okay. That's what it feels like. And this is the like day fifteen patch just came out. <laughs> Apparently they were still updating the game like as they were giving it to uh reviewers as well. Mm-hmm. They were giving like daily updates. Yeah. I th- I think what's the most egregious of this is uh CG CD Project Red previously had the um, had the reputation of being a very pro consumer company. They're giving free DLC. They're not putting in microtransactions, regardless of your thoughts on those. Mm -hmm. And so they had a lot of goodwill, specifically with The Witcher Three and those expansions. Um, Their their GOG, their uh, good old game Mm -hmm. storefront, being more um, more friendly towards smaller developers with their percentage cuts. And so, so they were like a bastion of like, wow, this is the way that big companies should be fucking running stuff. And I've never, I am not someone, I don't consider myself a hype content creator. Like there's some people that like very oddly attach themselves to brands Mm -hmm. and just like hype the, the the crap out of something. Like it's not even necessarily malicious. That's just not me. That's just not the kind of content that I look for, but it was all marketing on cd projects and just like pushing this front like pushing push pushing their marketing they did their job like kudos to whoever's in marketing you did you did your fucking job you deserve a raise they tricked they tricked the general public to being excited for a walkie-talkie rpg (laughs) Um, and um but the most egregious thing that uh, cd project red has done is they hid all the footage of the of the last gen versions they would say like oh here's ps4 footage but it's ps4 footage on the ps5 which is running infinitely better and which even at that it's not great (laughs) um so they hit the version that i I don't want to say most people will play because apparently the percentage of people uh, playing at least according to pre-orders i think it's 51 percent are on pc and then you'd you know have to break down the percentages of next of, of I guess current gen compared to last gen, even though uh, those numbers are still low because we're just at the um, we're still in the launch window. Mm-hmm. But that's ostensibly the version that a giant majority of people are going to be playing on is that last gen version, and it's so broken, it's not ready. That needed more time to come out there, and obviously that's not a rank and file. Uh, CD project developer issue that's corporate higher up according to uh, to emergency board meeting like yes the developers were telling upper management this is not ready we need to be delayed every single uh, launch period you've put out is not realistic it's not fucking ready and whether that's shareholders or just solely on leadership is is a whole other issue there's a fantastic but, Bloomberg article about um, the the, the developers asking um the directors of cd project red 
Um, and can I read just one quote real quick? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. Also, there's a great Medium article by someone on this <laughs> podcast describing all of this. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right, it's, oh, okay, here it is. Um, um, this is, I think, is probably my favorite quote from the entire thing. Another developer asked whether CG Projects directors felt it was hypocritical to make a game about corporate exploitation while expecting their employees to work overtime. The response was vague and noncommittal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's just I like feel... they pissed away so much of the. I'm sorry, I'll just go into this. I'll let you go mm-hmm. after Blaine. Um, it, they pissed away so much of their fucking goodwill built from The Witcher Three. Like they're like, we're pro consumer, but we're gonna hide the thing that lets you make an educated fucking consumer purchase, so that we can get your money. That that's it's so such a blatantly fucked up thing to do for someone who for a company that's holding themselves into that position. Um, I'm sorry, Blaine. Go ahead. No, that's fine. I feel like something I've been thinking about all day today, because this is um, this isn't the first time I've talked about this today. Is I think back to Fallout New Vegas. Ironically enough, apparently one of my favorite YouTubers posted a video about Fallout New Vegas tonight, and I've been hyped as fuck to watch it. Yeah, I DM during the podcast. It was like, yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah. I DM my friends like, oh, this is this is he's like hyping it up, and then all of a sudden I was like, oh, it's just out. But anyway, um, I think about New Vegas actually today after discussing how Obsidian was handed the Bethesda game works like uh, the the Bethesda game studios engine of Fallout 3 and assets and told you got a year fucking make make a spinoff do it. And they're like, what? And they no, do it. So they did it and they managed to make what is still arguably the best 3D Fallout ever made. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, that's just a fact. Yeah, Correct. despite despite Absolutely. the despite again being fucked up as hell on release. I mean, you know, they had bug fixes later. I remember playing the vanilla version after they had already started like patching and almost like I had trouble playing and getting into it. And then playing the complete version like years later and being like, oh, this is phenomenal and all my issues have disappeared. Um like that was a year, year in change. And under, not a choice, but, like, Bethesda telling Obsidian, you got this amount of time, fucking do it, or or whatever. And they had, like, eight years from announcement, like, more about, but really, I think the the figure is about five to four actual solid developments, actually, like, coding and shit like that. So, um, like, the fact that they had that much time to work on it, and the fact that, like, I mean, we know CD Projekt Red has money. We know they have money to back a thing. They made The Witcher. They that is a darling. I still haven't played it, and I'm actually kind of glad I haven't because I have nothing attached yeah. to that company other than using good old games. Ugh. Um, but like the the fact that like that, that you know that they're getting all this, that people, the fact they made their money back in a day just on pre-orders, from what I understand, like, and are making more money on top of that. There's no ex- there's no excuse for why the game either wasn't. I'm not even. This isn't me calling out developers on the ground level. This is me talking about management. There's no reason that this either wasn't done properly and released, the re- released in a playable state, or at the very least, they weren't able to take as much time as they needed to and not crunch the shit out of their workers. Because I know when extension delays usually don't mean less crunch; they usually mean more ungodly crunch. But there's just no. There's no. There's no the fact that the game is in the state it is. The fact that you have developers, you have these calls getting leaked, and that developers telling the people up the up the stairs like you can't release it like this. Like, it's just it blows my mind. It blows my mind. That this is what it's coming. You know. I think like one of you, one other aspect of it is just like I don't think like people have already been used to this game getting delayed. Like people would not have cared if it got pushed back even further and like no, if it came have. if it came down to the last gen hardware holding it back just fucking cancel it like if you don't yeah. want to put in that work if you'd rather spend the your resources improving the uh current gen and pc version that would that could be a smart decision but just fucking cancel it don't hide this shit and then let people buy it it's, it's jose you don't understand up. They, 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 they need to make sure they still get the good, the credit of the true gamers that support them and, you know, handing oh. out, like, little hypothetical money tokens to their employees instead of actually giving uh, I, I mean, 
Oh, I was going to say that like the the big problem here is not the big problem here is that delays are good, and the majority of gamers with a capital G don't believe that. They just get pissy. They're entitled. But the reality is every game, more or less, that gets delayed is better than what would have come without the delays. Mm-hmm. I would give some slight well, critiques to that in the sense yeah, that delays often create more crunch for developers. Also, sure. also with this particular thing, sure, delays, delay, delay. As Blaine said, around four or five years of actual game development, there's only a certain time where if the people at the top don't change, a delay is not going to fix it. That's yeah. true. That's very true. It's like how much more mismanaged, like, like, I bring up Fallout New Vegas because that was already mismanaged by Bethesda mm-hmm. going on top of the studio. This is like you're in house and man, yeah. you're still mismanaged. And how badly is it mismanaged that your in house development team you couldn't let them do what they need to do and not work them into the ground? Oh, you know? yeah. And um, so just as a as a result of all this, uh, CG Project Red took to their famous uh, yellow background with black text on it. <laughs> that is such a fucking ugly ass color. I'm sorry. Like, just like, did they not go to elementary? School? You, you don't do that. It, it's, they just don't it's, it's an eyesore. Um, yeah, they put out a statement saying that players that purchase digital versions of the, um, I guess, uh, uh, digital versions from either PlayStation or Xbox, that they should contact those respective uh uh, companies in order to seek refunds but that's a pretty fucking hollow statement when the stated refund policy for both microsoft and sony is if you already downloaded it you're not eligible for a refund so that's basically cg project saying yeah you can get a refund except you fucking can't like it's such a fucking slap in the face oh get a refund go to sony sony we're not going to do that what are you talking about call cd project red excuse me bitch Right. Yeah. And, then, and, and like the what's wild about this is that the story, like every day it just got crazier, right? Like I had to keep updating my crazier. article. I'm like, come on, just get it straight. Let me let me just do this one night, put it away. I don't gotta <laughs> worry about it. Cause what was the day after um cause and um I was just got done listening to a podcast at work where yes, it is pretty confirmed that Sony's pretty fucking pissed off mm-hmm. at uh C D project red for trying to put uh, the onus responsibility on Sony to like issue these refunds um, because it goes directly against their state policy. So Sony has come out and said like, yes, we will issue refunds, go ahead and contact us here, whatever. Um, but they just straight up delisted cyberpunk from PSN. You cannot mm-hmm. fucking buy it digitally. Correct. Mm-hmm. And that that's just big Sony. Uh, fuck you energy straight. And straight to CDPR. I can't. And think it it has never game. happened. Yeah, there, there's been stuff on like the publisher side. Like, obviously, there's the uh, the PT thing with Konami. Sure. There was um, um, Afro Sky Samurai. Afro yes. Samurai. Afro Sky, Samurai, you're right. Skybound temporarily taking down the that's the uh, Telltale games, mm-hmm. and then but it's them back never up. been like this where the no. company, like the the provo- the public, not the publisher, but like Sony, the game in town saying we're taking your game down like it's yeah just, like this mm-hmm. wasn't a rights issue or a lapse nope. of anything this is literally sony going well if this is this this is it's such a big risk for us to keep selling this game that we'd rather just stop sales and refund yep. because we're, otherwise we're going to be bleeding like a stuck pig and another the thing fact, oh go on oh Amazing. okay well i was gonna i was just gonna add, another thing is this is probably also going to change how these companies handle day one patches Oh yeah, mm. because for a lot of for like bigger companies, well known companies, you know they go they go to Sony and Microsoft and Nintendo and say, hey, I know this 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 is an issue that doesn't pass cert, but these will be fixed by by day one patch. You have our guarantee, right. and if it's like you know a big enough title, you know we'll be like, all right, that's probably gonna go away now. Yeah, they're probably gonna be it's like, no, nah, have a working have a working model of that that is going to be, or like sign some kind of agreement that if it's not that, that like I don't know some I don't know how that would work, but some kind of legal agreement that no one would sign unless they. Well, really that what? Okay, yeah. The, 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 I mean, from what I understand, there originally was that legal agreement. Oh. But it was it wasn't that <laughs> bad. It wasn't, but it was probably you're probably thinking of consequences that were probably worse than the the actual legal agreement, I right? Guess, which yeah. would be better. Like, I mean, something that that still pisses me off about this is, like, they've had the time to make... Uh, uh, Jeff from SDGC has actually talked at length about this. Mm-hmm. Probably going to end up paraphrasing it without meaning to, but 
literally they've had they've had time to, to make a new we're saw we we fucked up fucking post of like a million different things as far as like oh the bugs oh the we told you to get a refund oh sorry sorry we fucked up and didn't actually have permission to do those refunds and all this other shit i have not seen i've personally reached out to both cd project red and the cyberpunk main twitter on twitter about the fact that their toxic fan base is going after and attacking literally anybody who is even mildly critical of the game unless it's yep. specifically about the some of it even if it is the bug the fact that like someone that they worked with uh liana rupert i'm sorry if i mispronounced her name was who found the the epilepsy issue the key mm-hmm. epilepsy issue supposedly worked directly with them and they directly responded to her like oh we're working on a patch for this and blah 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 i never once saw them address their fan base and go hey guys stop sending this reporter epileptic seizure inducing videos disguised so, as something else that's fucking in order disgusting. to actually do that they never comment on that nope. but they know that they need to say something about the thing that's going to hurt their pocket but as long as their fan base mm-hmm. it doesn't care about giving people up epileptic seizures they'll just pretend like it, 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 it fucking infuriates absolutely we get sorry you, you were offended about the transphobia but then i'll have i still I, it seems to have stopped, but up until like two days ago, I still had a chuckle fuck responding to like weak old tweets of like, what exactly is transphobic in <laughs> cyberpunk? I'm like, bitch, I'm a trans woman who's just who's gotten laid off by COVID and has a mom dealing with like medical procedures. I don't got time to answer your fucking bullshit. Do a goddamn ghouls. It was just mismanaged from toe to tip. I mean, Absolutely. it's just exactly. it's just. At every point where they could have made the wrong choice, they made the wrong choice, and it's astonishing. It's it's unlike there's ne- like I I'm seeing local news coverage of cyberpunk, which I've never seen. Like you know, fucking New York Paul. Times writing about, yeah. it. <laughs> you and, know, uh, and getting some folks that might be what you're talking about. I'm sorry. No, I mean I'm talking about all of it. Like even just news channels on TV too, showing stuff about it because it just it transcended the gaming community because of what a wild trash fire it was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, and just building off the Sony stuff the day after um, Xbox is also offering refunds, which is a bit weirder, weirder of a situation because they have a marketing deal with CD project red because all their marketing stuff was shown at Xbox conferences and whatnot. And now apparently CD project red is also offering uh, refunds for retail copies. If um, consumers aren't able to return them to the place of purchase, but I mean, like on one hand, like, yes, tiny little clap for doing for doing this. But it shouldn't have come to this in the fucking first place. Mm-hmm. It's the bare minimum. They're doing the bare minimum yeah, now. To save face, and it's and not honest, And like times like these, um, I know, you know, they, they, they're, they, they're not great either. You know, they, 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 they got a lot of issues. Nintendo does. But like Breath of the Wild. They worked on it for five for like five years, I think. They delayed it when they needed to. From what I understand, there's there's reports that they, they do not crunch at Nintendo. Um, it came out. It was polished. It was good. They knew what they wanted to and aimed for it and worked on it until they got there. And it's just it, it's just it's just it just makes me really appreciate them in the industry. Sometimes, you know. I think it comes back to that that famous uh, Shigeru Miyamoto t- um, um, phrase: "A delayed game Mario's is eventually." Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, a delayed game is eventually good. However, I just don't know what's going on with Cyberpunk. Did they even test this? <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting to act to well actually you, and then I was like, oh, "No, this is good. This is a bit." <laughs> uh, but uh, I guess before we sign off on this story, I very specifically want to. Uh, put a spotlight on the on some of the more fucked up shit about uh, cyberpunk the, about the transphobia. Uh, they have in game ads, and they even had marking material with a trans mm-hmm. model with the penis and a skin tight outfits uh, mm-hmm. with the tagline of sixteen flavors you'd love to mix." Um, sexualizing uh, transgender people. So I want I want to say about that particular piece of art that I remember when that first came out, the artist came out the one the person who made it i believe it was a woman came out and said you know uh i i i i I designed this so that it would be um about you know how these companies are are taking bodies and sexualizing them for profit right i think in a bub i'm sorry go ahead i was gonna say i believe her in her intent as an artist in making that image i i 
don't believe, I strongly don't believe that CD Projekt even had a remote, remote of an idea of that when, when getting it and using it. And they were just like, oh, it's funny art, haha, and put it in the game. You know? I, I think for me, there's a lot of things that are tied into it. It's because uh, obviously, when you combine it with the giant list of stuff, it, it kind of builds credence <laughs> towards the opposite direction. Yeah. But it's also, if you create a fucked up piece of content, then you, you don't engage with it. If you don't provide critique, if it just exists mm-hmm. in the world, that just becomes the status quo. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to be real blunt for another minute here. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I've read that quote and I know I do want to believe that she had the best of intentions. I'm going to be real. I don't give a fuck what her intentions were. Unless she's a trans woman and I'm not aware of this and she was trying to like do some reclamation shit. I don't fucking care. Just stop. Just fucking cis people stop fucking doing that thing of like, oh, I want to do something nice for the trans folks. And then you have like a grade schooler's fucking understanding of this shit. Or rather, let me let me rephrase this. Like, a cis person thinking that they've had this brilliant idea of, I'm going to be subversive with a transgender character, and don't talk to any trans people, and then you do some shit that we've seen time and time again. Fucking stop it, alright? I'm a woman with a dick. I can be sexual when I want to, and everything else, but I'm just, don't fucking give me that bullshit of, well, I, because her little quote from my memory is like, well, I find this character sexy, and that's, and you know, but this is a okay, quote I, do I, for, I forgot then, that part of the no, quote. No, 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 like, it's it's not your fault, because the <laughs> no, quote no, itself no. is not super toxic, <laughs> it's just that, it's like, well, I, oh, I find the character sexy regardless, and I, you know, this is about, like you, like you said, Maybe like, oh, this is about um, the the corporations taking this and perverting it or using this to do a bad thing. But then, like, there's nothing, as Jose yeah. pointed, there's nothing to balance it against. There's mm-hmm. one trans character in the game supposedly that is actually well written or something. And I've seen trans people not even realize that character is trans until other people have pointed it out. In the game. And granted, again, you shouldn't. In the same way, you don't need a Mexican character in a game to be a stereotype with a sombrero and blah 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 blah. You also don't need a trans person talking about her dick every five seconds. But mm-hmm. I don't know. There's just something about that disconnect where you have trans people criticizing this to hell and back, not even aware of that character, and then people are like, well, "Wait, what about this character?" And even then, that's your one trans character. Yet you have the Watson Horad, just disgusting trans woman mm-hmm. vomiting the toilet and with her balls on display. You have the Chromanticure fucking. Ad that's just the big neon glowing dick and mix it up that might i add they had a cosplay contest and one of the runner-up finalists was a cis woman who cosplayed the woman from that ad like oh, wow like fuck i'm sorry i ranted i just no, i fucking good. hate this game i hate it <laughs> and i'm so tired of cis people not y'all mm. cis people who refuse to fucking listen and used to step outside their own fucking bubble like maybe we don't want you to do us this fucking favor if you can't even fucking grasp it like go fuck yourself at that i'm in full agreement with that um yeah. just just to go down to the list of, like some of the other shit that they've done is uh doing like very shitty fucking right wing and anti sgw dog whistles of uh Mm -hmm. of uh did you just assume their gender obviously in bad faith and then when people called them out on their shits they did the typical well i'm sorry you got offended i'm not sorry Mm -hmm. i did it yep um so that choice of words is uh co-opting a trans a pro transgender hashtag via the good old games twitter and then again doing the whole oh we're just gonna stick to games we we didn't we stepped out of our wheelhouse it's like no you just shouldn't fucking open your mouth you don't know what you're Mm mm-hmm um, there's on, there's also yeah. um, related uh, dog whistles, such as the uh, I'll, I'll read the quotes. According to NCPD statistics, this model is found in as many as 17 percent of reported accidents in Night City, despite making up only two percent of all registered vehicles, which is a fucking uh, nod to a, um, a very false um, a black crime statistic. Yeah, 1350. Mm-hmm. So you, there's people in that studio that are very. Uh, they're Absolutely. very right wing. Mm-hmm. It's it's, uh, it's straight up white fucking nationalism. It's it's worth mentioning that there's big red zone Poland that are self declared anti LGBT or LGBTQAA free zones. Mm-hmm. Um, nationalism is on the rise up there. White nationalism specifically. Um, fascism seems to be on the rise, which is fucking both. It's not even ironic. It's just sad. Mm-hmm. And I mean the anti the homophobia over there is rampant. Like, a fucking shit show 
I guess it's just surprising to me that like, like when this stuff first started pouring out is because, you know, like they were known for the Witcher and the Witcher novels. I'm not done reading through all of them. I'm kind of lagging behind on on reading through um, Tower of Swallows. But those are very progressive books in a lot of ways. They're they're like just for example, they're very, very fucking pro choice. Um, mm hmm. But it's just weird that a studio would take a very progressive thing and then they turn around. It's like, oh, yeah, there's a bunch of fucking right wing shitheads doing their cyberpunk thing. It's correct me if I'm wrong, Jose. Weren't you the one that pointed out? And this isn't a gotcha. This is, I mean, I'm agreeing with you. Weren't you the one that pointed out that in the Witcher novels, Geralt is actually sorry. Geralt is actually. Um, oh, no, you said it right the first time. Yeah. I did. Yeah, yeah. Geralt. Yeah. yeah, Geralt. Oh, I had someone yell at me about that. Um, <laughs> they are wrong. Geralt, <laughs> Geralt is, has. Uh, is a disability in the in the books from a certain mm -hmm. point onwards and it never goes away in the games right. they don't address that at all they just pretend nope. it doesn't happen correct yeah. so also the, yeah. the 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 game celebrates uh battering women in a way that's uncomfortable um there's a lot of violence towards women in the games mm -hmm. um, and i love the witcher 3 and i love the witcher games but like People people pretended, I think, to a degree that CD Projekt Red was more progressive than they are. There's some great stuff in The Witcher, and there are some things that are done really well with those kinds of narratives, and um, a, a, and even some queerness in in them as well. But it just they've not they're not the progressive studio that people made them out to be, just because they had the appearance of. And I think it's all coming to light here with yeah. everything that's happened over the last year. They love to pr I'll fucking drop another hot take. They love to push on their on Twitter how like Project Red Twitter about like oh cultural diversity in our place. And yet, if you do a search for LGBTQIA and or LGBTQA or IA and CD Project Red's Twitter, no results, none. Yeah. No top results. You search LGBTQ cyber. There's my dog. <laughs> if you search LGBTQ and cyberpunk, um, I'd rather CD Project Red's Twitter. You get tweets from people adding cd project red's twitter right. you get things like of them selling their pride t-shirts and whatnot or people who are wearing the pride t-shirts mm -hmm. there has never been as far as i've been able to search and i think jeff from this gc did a similar search and couldn't find mm -hmm. anything there's no mention of any like oh hey happy pride or or, or any kind of acknowledgement of the lgbt community by their twitter there is the closest thing i found was there was CD Projekt Red ch changing their Facebook profile picture in certain right. countries to a Pride logo involving their logo, but then in like Saudi Arabia, they didn't change it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they clearly, and, um... they clearly don't give a shit unless it is something they are to address. And even then, it seems like that's not enough. And uh, I guess just one last thing I want to do before we wrap up, just because uh, it's going on a bit. Um, yeah, I, it, it did piss me off that the game, like like when it says like, oh, you can put whatever genitals you want. Mm -hmm. um, it, it comes off as, as a very shitty like, oh, ha ha ha. You can put a fucking dick on whatever uh, with a, especially with a fucking slider or whatever. But um, locking the locking pronouns to the masculine voice. or feminine voice is, is yeah. fucked up. Yeah, because it, it, it just goes against what they were trying to mm -hmm. supposedly do to be progressive. Yeah. They brought all that up after the backlash against the Chromanticure ad and everything else, while still not really apologizing for it, and then they fucked that up. Yep. And on top of that, like, um, I remember like when someone was like, "Oh, there's only like because what there's like four there's like four or six options for dicks, but it's really like two dicks with multiple sizes." Meanwhile, mm -hmm. I think there's like almost no options for a vagina. There's one. Nope. There, but, yeah, oh, I, guess I guess technically there's two, but it's, uh, do you want one or do you don't? Yeah. <laughs> that's oh, do it. you want it, Do you want to be a Ken doll or not? That's exactly. Stupid. That's stupid. I mean, it's Which, fine that that option exists, but there should be more. If you're going to make a big deal out of it. And yep. Honestly, it shouldn't exist in the game in the day. first place. All right. It's, I think that's worthless. going to. Um, I think that's going to wrap it up just because we're tight on time. Uh, any last Sorry words for from anybody? So much. No, I know it's all good, man. It was important. Mm. It's worth saying. And you know what sucks about this even more? At least <laughs> for me personally so far, is that these are also some of the best side quests in a walkie-talkie RPG I've ever played. That's what I've heard now. Is that I've this game too. is also fantastic. Yeah. And it's oh so frustrating. <laughs> it's so I've annoying. Heard, I've heard that, and then I see the clip that's like V saying saying, Oh, not all cops are bastards. Then I found out that apparently the shit kicked out of them by cops in the opening. 
That was oh, one of the wow. one of the one of the things. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's stupid. This game is <laughs> this is a stupid game made by stupid people, and like ten of ten of those thirty stupid people made a good game. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Blaine and Mesa, thank you for being uh, continual hosts on here, and thank you very much to Storm for uh, for coming on. It's thank been you a for long having... journey, but I'm glad to have you here. My, uh, yeah, it was, thank you again for having me on. Um, I I knew everyone um, except Mason before this call, but I hope to get to know you after. Uh, this has been great. Um, I, oh. I I really dig the show. Sincerely, I enjoy it, and it's been a pleasure to be here. Oh, thank you. I'll, I'll try to salvage what a- audio I can from the beginning. So if you want to drop your your links and uh, your plugs right here, feel free. Sure. Uh, I mean, really simply and really quickly, uh, I do a bunch of different podcasts. You can find everything that I work on at djstormageddon.com. Um, I stream. I host four different podcasts. I produce eight different podcasts. Um, but uh, definitely go check it out. And if you want to keep up with the day-to-day of what I'm working on, the best place is Twitter, which is DJ underscore Stormageddon. All right. Awesome. Thank you guys for hanging out and we will maybe, maybe not do an episode next week. Cause that's the day after Christmas and I'm going to be tired and sleepy. Yeah. Tired and sleepy <laughs> is a big mood. Big, big, big mood. So for like 10 hours today. All right. Thank you guys. And we All will right. see you next time. Bye, Bye everybody.